Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you want to talk and listen about and, and really hear about plants, because that's what we're all about here on this show. My name is Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department, so I might talk perennials or cut flowers, but I also have three highly knowledgeable and talented folks next to me. So I'm gonna introduce each one of them and they may give a little bit of information about what their expertise is and we're gonna do some show and tells and also some uh, email questions. So let's start first with you, Shane Cultra. Hello, I'm Shane Cultra. I'm one of the family, members of the family that own Country Arbors Nursery and Culture Nurseries in Onarga. And we grow plants, we sell plants, and we <coughs> install plants. So if it has to do with plants, that's what we do all day. And uh, I answer questions about pretty much perennials, trees, and shrubs. I don't do a lot of house plants, but everything else I, I can answer. And today I brought something that shows that plants don't just magically appear in a three gallon pot or five gallon pot, that somebody actually has to start them somehow. And today I brought in Taxus densiforma, better known as just U. And this is a little U cutting that we did that is literally the tip cutting of a shrub that you see in your yard. And it's, um, it's not a real difficult process. It just is, it has to be done at the right time. And we just take the tip cutting and we put the proper hormones and we don't dip anymore. We actually spray. So okay. we, use a, uh, we spray down the, the, the uh, soil. We put it on a heated mat and mist on the top. And then we spray the top again and these little roots appear. And, and the, uh, the funny part is we took these in the summer and they didn't root at all. They rooted over the winter. And so um, it's nice to come back at the beginning of spring and see that your root, they're all rooted up. This will go into a, we'll probably put this into a two and a quarter, three inch pot, then move it into a one gallon, then move it into a five gallon. And from cutting to five gallon is seven years. So wow. when people complain about a plant being $35 to $40, see how many things you can create in seven years and see what it costs. It's, uh, it's in a long, long process. And then trying to gauge how many you're going to sell, think about that. Think about trying to figure out how much food you're going to eat seven years from now or how many plants you need seven years down the road. So that's another part that's difficult as far as trying to plan out what you're gonna do. But it's a great process. I mean, everybody, if they could do that for mm -hmm. a living, go out and make plants. It's our babies. I go out there every day. Today, I saw they were a little dry, and I said, <laughs> oh, we gotta water our plants. And, and so these are how the babies are made, and then uh, you get to see them at the nursery. I just love starting things small. I like yeah. seeds, I like bare root things, I like cuttings, I like layering. Yeah. I just think it's fascinating to see it grow from yeah. almost nothing. It's, it, it's fun. And then you, and the other thing you say, okay, I can grow one. Now, how do I grow 10,000? You know, that's, okay. the, that's the other thing you I have to figure that. out to do this scale thing as far as how to scale it out. But it's, it's super exciting. And in this, in here, there's probably 200 plants in this little square. Amazing. Will be a whole yard full of plants at some point. Amazing. And hopefully they have natural pruning and are not shearing them. Yeah, that's these a lot. Are all low I think of the no work. Maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> but natural pruning is the way to go. Oh, not that I'm biasing. Yeah. Well, we naturally pruned audience. them when we made the cuttings. Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. That's really good to see that. All right. Now, Marianne, you're next. This is Marianne Metz. Thank you. Marianne Metz. Um, I'm a horticulturalist and landscape designer and a gardener. And currently, my home away from home is Prairie Gardens in Champaign. And I'm sure. I've done this before. I, I know a lot of you know that I'm all about color. I love color. And this time of year, it's very difficult to actually imagine color in the landscape uh, when it's gray and snowy and icy. And But you know what? Walking through my yard in the last couple of days and, okay, around the neighborhood with my pruners, um, I, I've come across a lot of <laughs> color, and I wanted to share it. And what I have here are some examples of the color that you can have in your garden. And you can see from evergreens, broadleaf evergreens, and some barks, some coral barks, some um, cornice, some dogwoods with different colored barks, uh, birch trees, snake bark maples, camisipris, yellow leaf, or yellow needle camisipris. There's just all sorts of colors that you can have in um, the garden in the wintertime. And this is just a small example of blue needle uh, evergreens, green needled, yellow needled. I love the, the different colored barks on many things. And e even some of the uh, broadleaf evergreens that have interesting uh, winter color as well as stem color, leaf color. Marianne, you've got to talk about the draping one. 
What's the dra which drapey one? The one right oh, by Shane, the Pyrus. really drapey one. Pyrrhus. Um, this is really a, an interesting plant. And that's um, P P I E. E R I S, I not Paris, Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus. <laughs> uh, has a beautiful white bloom, and these are the uh, flower clusters. Uh, it's it's an evergreen. Um, sometimes people will refer to it as semi evergreen. It depends on how you have it located. But it, it's really important in um, our environment in, in the Midwest, in central Illinois, um, that your evergreens um, and broadleaf evergreens have a lot of good moisture going into the fall and, and the beginning of winter, and then to maintain that moisture because that protects them against the winter winds and the colds that we have that you know, they come and go and come and go and it's really difficult for these plants to to maintain themselves without the proper moisture so that hydration early is really important to keep these looking really good but boy I'll tell you what this every season this 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 puppy has different things to add this this is white white flowers or pink flowers rose colored flowers in the spring and then after this is done it maintains its green leaves because it's an evergreen it has the most incredible new growth, which can be fiery red, rose, whites, just the beautiful combinations. So you'll have the flowers, then you have the new foliage, but it's all backdropped by this beautiful green foliage. So it's really an interesting plant, but it really needs to be protected from the wind. Is that really. the definition of four season plant? That's, I would say that that's pretty much the definition mm -hmm. of a four season plant. Love it, love it, love it. But again, the winter winds around here, you really do have mm -hmm. to find the, just the right place. To, to yeah, get just the right place, <clears throat> right plant, right place. Yeah. Right, that's words to live by in gardening in the Midwest. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Marianne. That is very colorful. All right, let's go next to you, Phil. This is Dr. Phil Nixon. Hi, I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois, which means I do bugs. And we have an email that Dennis from Tenley Park sent in. He says, I have a milkweed with seed pods as they are about to open, they're covered with insects. Does your entomologist know what's going on? And yes, these are large milkweed bugs, and uh, they're, a, they're a great uh, addition to the garden. Um, I actually have done a program a few times on, um, on, on beautiful bugs in your <laughs> garden. And, uh, and I take about a third of the time on milkweed because lots of the insects there will produce, uh, will produce very colorful, are very colorful, because it's warning coloration or aposematic uh, coloration, they call it. And it's essentially a, uh, a thing that uh, says, you know, you better recognize me because I'm going to make you sick if you eat me. And, uh, mm. and really, people will grow uh, milkweeds with the idea that they're going to save monarchs. But in my opinion, you know, you can, you can, there are various types of, of other insects that are quite colorful on the milkweed. Uh, in fact, there's a book that uh, I picked up a while back that's called uh, Milkweed Monarchs and More, and, uh, and it's essentially an entire book just about, uh, just about the insects that will come to, you, to your milkweeds. And I mean, there's just bunches of them. <laughs> and uh, some of them are feeding on, feeding on others. You know, they get, they get bright yellow aphids on them. They get, uh, they get their the nice uh, uh, milkweed bugs. Uh, the milkweed beetles are, are red with black spots. Uh, the milkweed tussock moth has uh, has has got a, some black and some and some yellowish color on it as a larva. I mean, they're just fabulous. And uh, you know, in my opinion, you don't need to have a milkweed blooming. You've got bugs that are that are doing just <laughs> as well as far as nice coloration on the milkweed. And uh, the milkweed bugs are feeding on the seed pods, and unless you're trying to, and they're eating the seeds, and they're causing them to not sprout very well. But most people don't want more milkweeds around in their yard anyway than what they plant. And so it's actually a, a kind of, uh, of birth control for milkweeds if you want these bugs on them and they really don't hurt anything but the seed pods. And most of the insects that occur on milkweed don't really keep it from growing very well. The only time I've ever seen them really strip is by monarch caterpillars. So uh, enjoy your milkweeds and enjoy the bugs that come with them. They're great. Bugs to know and love. Bugs to know and love. That was the subtitle of your section. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those were colorful. That's very interesting. What an interesting book, too. This is the number one seller of the milkweed bug section of Amazon right now. Wow. Oh, yeah. There are a lot in that section. <laughs> uh, there's one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I suspected so. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. Let's go to the uh, extra special video section called Did You Know Next? 
Japanese beetles can fly as far as five miles, but are poor flyers and can be caught easily. When approached, they lift their spiny hind legs up in the air to scare off the intruder. All right, let's go to the phone lines next. And Sharon has a question about a bee on line two. Hi, Sharon. Hi, um, I have a question about the endangered rusty patched uh, bumblebee that was just declared endangered. No. I'm wondering what's going to be the implication to uh, agriculture and gardening from that? Uh, well, that actually, the rusty patch bumblebee is just kind of a uh, of, of a first part of what really is is a real concern, and that is that uh, for the last for for a number of years, the last ten or fifteen years or more, uh, they've been losing species of bumblebees in California left and right, or getting close to losing them. And there's some pathogen that they think was brought in on people buying in bumblebee colonies. Is probably the most likely thing. Uh, and uh, really, bumblebees are are. Uh, are buzz pollinators. They actually will come up to a plant and they vibrate their wings to knock out the pollen and so on. In the, in the, and in the process, they actually pollinate some flowers that, to be blunt about it, honeybees are too wimpy to mess with. Um, you can't get honeybees to pollinate alfalfa, for instance, and uh, some other types of legumes. Uh, and, uh, and actually with their buzz pollination, vibrating their wings, bumblebees do a great job of that. And they're important parts of, of the landscape. And we just kind of missed out on some of them. And what the real implication is of, of that bee going endangered, we really don't know. We've got a, uh, the, the ecosystem out there is a patchwork of a lot of little parts that all fit together and work. And to be honest with you, we really don't know how many parts we can pull out and destroy without the whole thing collapsing. But we do know when that collapses, we'll be over as a species. So it'll be all over for us. We'll die out uh, because without the insects and the rest of the ecosystem, we can't exist. So uh, it's all that sort of thing is we don't know how many we can lose without having losing everything. But uh, if we do, we'll know it too late. That's kind of a glum way of looking at it, but, but other than really, that, that's we'll kind of the way okay, it is. Right? Other than that, it's a great thing, <laughs> yes. Uh, we were trying to think of a positive thing yeah. to it, but. Well, a positive thing is, is that you, uh, is you try to maintain what you, right. what you inherited and pass those on to your children and grandchildren uh, because it's really the right thing to do. It's, it's just not dollars and cents. It's enjoying the world and having a nice one to live in. And I think planting a lot of diverse things mm -hmm. so that hopefully the insects, and I enjoy seeing the insects. You know, let things happen. Don't be And adding. I say don't go to the garden center and complain about the holes in the leaves and the plants. Exactly. And Just they, they, people, part, of part of the biggest problem in garden centers, I mean, the growers are bigger, but people can't accept any flaw in the leaf or they won't buy it. Yeah. And if they do, they'll question They will stand in line 10 deep to question the three holes in their rows. And, and they, they want the chemical answer, and that's not the right answer. And I try to start with my students and show them these things. I say, now, I want you to know perfection is overrated. Yeah. Get over perfection. It's not good in anything. Yeah. And let the... Let a couple things feed on yeah, the leaves. Yeah, let right? it I'll be more natural. I just say, oh, you got, you got holes in your leaves? Fantastic. I want wow, charge extra so that you have Wow, that's so artistic bugs. looking or something. Yeah, but that's, that's the circle of life. So there <laughs> you have it, Mid-American Gardening Philosophy. Yeah. We'll, we'll go from there, <laughs> but let's do go to uh, the next caller, and we're going to go to um, Shirley's question on line three about tomatoes. Hi, Shirley. Hi. Um, I have a question about uh, planting tomato uh, seeds. I planted tomato seeds, and I would like to know, do you put them in a sunny window, or do you put them in the shade? Last year, I put some tomato seeds in a cup, I put them in the sunny window, and they didn't do very good. It's probably a couple of approaches to that. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> and we can give several approaches to I, it. Yeah, I think there's a, two things that you have to remember um, is that they like a, a little more humid environment. So if you just placed a cup in a very bright window, um, there was probably no moisture in the air practically, and it probably the seeds, if they when they uh, uh, germinated. Sprouted. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you, everybody. Came up. <laughs> when they came up, I like that. Um, they, they were just so, they just didn't have enough moisture around mm -hmm. them to, to survive. And, and also, you really don't need that kind of a bright light to, to start seeds anyway. Um, don't need shade particularly either, but just kind of a medium light. And I know a lot of people start them under, under artificial light, which mm -hmm. is probably the best scenario because it's more controllable. But when those do sprout, those tomatoes need as much light as they can get, right? And that's exactly right. Uh, well, I don't, know that, I, I with, don't know that I'd put them in a south window yeah. that's right up against a window, but I would certainly have um, maybe even a kind of a tent-like thing over them to um, keep that humidity around them for mm -hmm. for probably weeks. But you also need airflow, so that, you know it's it's kind of a balance. But yeah, um, when you're starting them, we don't worry about them when they're when they're haven't sprouted yet. But once they sprouted. Then they get all lanky and turn yes. and soft, mm -hmm. and then you have this tomato that's making the S curve. You know, they don't have to be perfect, they're tomatoes. Right. But you, right. you do have to watch the light inside, or you know, you should try and get the right spectrum of the light. And starting them now, you know, people are so antsy. We get, <laughs> don't. You know, we get in the Midwest, we get 60, don't and they're planting tomatoes, it. and they're gonna have a six foot tall, jumbled mess Straight. of tomatoes. <laughs> Intertwined okay. with six other they're tomatoes. Cheap, though. You can always throw them away and start the next batch the next time. It's it just to too watch. early. It, it's even yeah. a little too early for some of the early crops. We've yes. got people coming into the garden centers already so ready for spring. You it's have tomatoes just, yet? Yeah, it, it, it's, so, it's, it's great Absolutely. though. And I mean, that's when yeah. you say R-E yeah. L-A-X, relax. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just, uh, Soon. They, you know, Soon you know, will happen. I like having people out there. It's been a while since I've seen yeah, people. That's true. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody since Christmas. Let them come out. Yeah. Sell them some house plants exactly. or I don't know. Something. Some evergreen yep. <laughs> or something. So anyway, try some of these ideas and that I think will help you out, surely. Okay, let's go to Dorothy's question and she's got a raspberry question. Line four. <laughs> Last week, I caught the last of the film on raspberry bushes, and I, I couldn't uh, um, determine what I was to do with the raspberry bushes. That was Dr. Skirvin, Bob Skirvin. So I, I believe, I don't know, unless someone wants to jump in, but I think he said that you can uh, do some pruning down. Some of them grow too early, and... And I think he was talking about pruning to get more fall. Um, yeah, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry. So if anyone wants to jump in, but um, well, don't you think that raspberries? It's a it's a every year process, and you're not always addressing the same um, canes. Exactly. If you were, it, you know, there there comes a, a point where you really do just have to take some of the older canes down to the ground, uh, making air circulation better, mm -hmm. light better for the for the berries that are there. You know, if it's a, a variety that's really tall and gangly, you can even start new ones just by letting it lay on the ground and start a new plant. Uh, but pruning them back to either fit into your space or, or be easier to harvest, those are things to consider. Yeah. I just thin them out exactly like that. So, you know, there's, depending on which varieties you have, yeah. but but I think that was the gist of it, not having them all stay all and time. not, you right. need to prune some of them out, some yeah. of the older ones. Because he said that they will flower on different, you know, different times that you get them more vigorously right. if you've done some pruning. So I hope that helps you. Uh, he gave a very thorough one, but I think Marianne did a great job too. Oh, so. thank you. I couldn't remember all he had said. Let's go to Rosemary's question on line six, and it's about Easter cactus. Wow, we're saying Easter cactus. Hi there, Rosemary. Line, did I say six? I meant five. Rosemary, line five. Hello, are you there? Yes, what is your question? Well, I've had this Easter cactus for about four years, and I have yet to get a blossom. Can you give me some good advice about how to go about taking care of this? in order to get some flowers. Okay, who wants to jump in on Easter cactus? That's you. I can jump in. Yeah. Here I am. Go for it's, it. It's not unlike Christmas cactus. You know, Easter cactus are, are, are a little bit unusual. Uh, they're, they're not quite in the market like Christmas cactus. You see Christmas cactus everywhere in the winter time. Easter cactus have a little bit different lobe um, shape on, on the end of each little section and their flowers are a little more open and cactus looking, cacti looking. Um, and, and what initiates them usually are temperatures and, and light levels, oh, initiates the flowers. And I've found personally that having a little cooler environment, environment so in a, a room that doesn't have a lot of heat and in um, light that's pretty low, um, so it'll start initiating the bud development 
and I would probably have that in that kind of a situation until, um, oh gosh, probably mid-March. And you'll, you'll probably start to see the bud development at that time. Okay, you did very well. Oh, well, you know what? It's, it's about forgetting a plant. That's, what, that's basically what it hap is, is what it's about. With Christmas don't. cactus and Easter cactus both. I, I put my Christmas cactus under a bush for the summer and don't water them, don't do anything to them. And at the end of October, I bring it indoors. You can't leave a Easter cactus outdoors, so I put it in a north room where it doesn't get a lot of light. Ignore it. Doesn't have a lot of, yeah, don't water them often. And then when they start developing, that's when you want to start watering, giving it a little more light. And usually they, they do pretty good. Excellent. <laughs> Ignore and do well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And now we're going to go to Suzanne's question. This is line six, and it's about an insect. Hi, Suzanne. Hi. What's your um, question? Well, I have a uh, really big picture window with all my, I have a few from outside that I bring in, like you said, uh, um, cactuses that I bring outside all year and and a few house plants and then I, I do my some of my herbs I start there mm -hmm. in that window and I've been noticing a lot of stink bugs lately so what do you think is going on because I'm going to start my uh, tomatoes soon over here and I don't really like that I'm not getting a lot of them but uh, you may be seeing brown marmorated stink bugs they're coming out more and more in, into houses because they're building up in their populations. Uh, they're about a half an inch long and they're, and they're kind of shield shaped uh, and uh, brownish with black marmorations, which you won't find in a dictionary. A marmoration <laughs> is a squiggle, but it's uh, something that we, in taxonomy, they used for a squiggle as a marmoration. Uh, but at any rate, uh, they spend the winter in, in nature underneath loose bark of trees and they come in around the edges of windows and so on and through cracks and crevices for the winter into our houses and the way to keep them out is to kind of caulk around the windows and this will help keep them out and you can remove them by hand if you see them inside sprays aren't going to do much to them but the main thing is is they're not going to they're not going to really worry a whole lot about your plants they're kind of all setting getting set to just go back outside and uh and reproduce and and uh, have more stink bugs and so what the ones you're seeing inside are just kind of just kind of hanging out if they get too warm they'll use up all their their food energy and you'll find them dead on their back on the windowsill but you know probably don't need to worry about them unless they're just a nuisance you can remove them but uh, don't worry about your plants okay Gee, that's all we need is something new that wants to move into the house. I haven't seen that. I so, hope I don't. So your cats find them. Yeah, yeah we're getting them in the St. Louis, St. Louis metropolitan area pretty heavy. Okay. Hundreds coming into the house in the fall, hmm. uh, which is kind of like in the Northeast where we're getting thousands. And yeah, it's, oh, uh, wow. Gee. It's, it's, it's coming and we've got them throughout the state. Okay. Something to look forward to. Oh, thank you, Phil. Give That's it another 10 so years. We'll, be, we'll know what they're all about. That's all we need. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm intrigued about Terry's question. It's about a plant, and it's the shape of a plant. And let's go to his question on line two. Hi, Terry. Hi. I was just wondering why the, the tomato plants, whenever me and my neighbor, Miss Kay, uh, we plant tomato plants. And let them grow, and but they get they get real, real long before they start leafing out. And could it, could you make it to where it uh, is fatter, like grow them to where the root would be fatter? So you're growing them inside, and they get too long, or it's when you put them outside? Yeah, inside. Inside. Okay, Shane, you want to discuss? Yeah, that's just that's the stretching of the wrong light. So I don't know how to put it. the spectrum of light makes makes plants. Uh, stretch and that's a uh, you know in the trade unfortunately sometimes we'll put growth inhibitors to try and shrink them like kale if you ever go look at the kale at our nursery some years it's this long because we're growing at the wrong time and it stretches out um, the thing about that's great about tomato is though you can bury it as deep as you want mm -hmm. so you take that long stretch and dig a long deep hole and bury the whole to tomato so that only the top is sticking out that's what i always do and now all that long plant that you don't like will now become the roots of the plant so it's go ahead and take it use it to your advantage but it's really about getting the right spectrum of light uh, and of course it grows to the light if your light's over here and your plant's here it's going to stretch out and go find the light and we have a plant pathologist that comes on this show quite often named Jim Schuster. And uh, when he was working as a horticulturist in, in the Chicago area, he used to say, 
we, we got to what we used to call the Schuster shake. Uh, he'd say every day you go out and you sh or maybe twice a day and you shake your tomatoes in, in the pot, the pot, and this will build up more sclerenchyma tissue, make them shorter and not as leggy. And so Did he run uh, a fan he's well known him? for the Schuster shake. Yeah. Did he have a fan going on him to make him toughen up that way? Because you can. And what you kind can of do tissue that was that? He was always just shaking them every day. Schuster shake. The Schuster kind of, shake. Yeah. What kind of scleroderma? Sclerenchyma. Oh, I it's, haven't said that for a long time. More thickened cell walls uh, that have built up. Sclerenchyma. It's it's, <laughs> it's 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 my fault for ha having too much. Bought me in my background. Yeah. No, I remember it well <laughs> now that you say it. Could be your middle name, I actually. I don't know. It's a difference between parenchyma and sclerenchyma. Oh, no, yeah. never mind. Yeah. With that, we have to go to the end of the show. Thank you so much for watching.